Hey folks, y'all know about Root, right? It's a really cool, really asymmetric game about woodland creatures duking it out in the forest. Maybe you've been really interested, but you keep hearing about how it's better at four players and you don't have that many friends who want to join, or maybe you just want to play solo. Well, with the Clockwork expansion, you can do just that, replacing as many of the four base game factions with automated opponents. You do still need the base game and the knowledge of how it works, but once you got that sorted, we can learn how to play with Clockwork. So before we get started, two quick things. First, just in case there are any mistakes in this video, please turn on the Klingon subtitles, which is where I'll fix them. And second, I'm going to be occasionally coming back to games that I've taught in the past and covering their expansions, which is what's happening here. I let my Patreon backers choose what I teach, so if there are specific games, and now expansions, that you want to see covered on RTFM, joining the Patreon is the best way to make that happen. Okay, clockwork time. These four AI factions, or bots, can be used to replace any human players in a game of Root. So if you want to play solo against three AI opponents, or you've got a few friends and just want to add one or two more enemies, doesn't matter, you can make it work. Now each faction will have its own rules, but there are a few shared mechanics that mostly deal with priority and card play. Let's start by getting our priorities straight. If you're playing with any number of bots, add these clearing priority markers. There are diagrams in the manual for each map layout, so find yours and place the tokens to match. The priority markers will be used in different ways by each faction, but they're all to do with which clearings get targeted during a bot's turn. Most bot actions have built-in tiebreakers, but if it's still tied, the bot will choose based on which clearing has a higher priority, with 1 being the highest and 12 being the lowest. And while we're at it, if a bot is choosing between multiple tied factions, it breaks ties based on the faction's setup priority. Next up, each faction has a difficulty level and 4 trait cards. During setup, choose what level of difficulty you want to play, normal doesn't have a card, and how many traits you want to include. You can choose or pick them randomly, and you can add as many as you want, just know that each one generally increases the difficulty. And if you're playing by yourself or with just one other human player, remove all four dominance cards. Even if you have three or more humans though, the bots can't play dominance cards. In fact, the bots use cards pretty differently in general. They'll only draw cards when they need to, so only the human players will draw a starting hand. Instead, at the beginning of a bot's turn, it'll always draw one card to be used as its order card. This will determine what steps it will take during its action, and this will be different for each bot. They can't discard cards, so if they're ever told to give a card to a human, the human draws a card instead. If a bot ever draws or is given a card, they discard it, and the bot gains a point. They can craft item cards, but they don't need crafting buildings or anything like that. The item does need to be in the supply though, and instead of the points listed on the card, they'll always just score one. Also, they can't craft any non-item cards. And a few quick rules to wrap up the basics. First, if you're in battle with a bot, they'll always remove tokens before buildings, and if it has multiple buildings, you choose randomly. Also, you can't ever use ambush cards against bots. And lastly, if you want to play cooperatively against the bots, remove all dominance cards, regardless of player count, and then each human needs to score 30 points before any bot does. Bots won't treat other bots as enemies, but humans can target other humans, which is very human when you think about it. And if you want to spice it up a bit more, the rulebook has a few suggestions. Okay, now that we've got the basics out of the way, let's cover each faction individually. So the thing about playing with clockwork is that once you got the basics down, the stuff we already talked about, taking an AI turn is usually as easy as following the instructions on the board. There's no need to memorize them, so I won't be covering every single thing in detail, but I will go over the important aspects of each faction, and I'll give a couple big examples with each faction taking a typical AI turn. So let's start with the cats. And yes, there is another version of the mechanical marquees, but this is a 2.0. It's better by a full 1.0. Anyway, these felines have a few key differences from their normal versions, mainly that they don't have the hospital's ability unless you play with that trait card, and they don't produce wood. They're still going to do a lot of building, but they won't need resources to do it. Instead, their order card will determine what they're going to build based on the matching suit. The suit of the order card will also determine where they'll battle, recruit, and move from. Of course, if you draw a bird, they'll have an escalated daylight phase, which does the same stuff but in a way that's a little bit more advantageous for the cats. And then at the end of their turn, they'll score based on an empty building space, also determined by their order card. Now let's move on to the bird's clockwork faction, the Electric Eerie. Their basic concept is the same as the regular birds, but they don't have leaders, and the order spaces are based on suits instead of actions. They'll draw an order card and add it to the decree, which they'll then resolve. They'll do all their recruits, then moves, and then battles, but unlike the normal Eerie, not every card in the decree will be used for every action. 
And then once that's done, these electro birds will build a roost in the highest priority clearing they can manage. And lastly, they'll score the same way the birds normally do. Now they can skip to create actions if they aren't possible, but if the birds can't place a roost, they'll go into turmoil, losing a point for each bird card in the decree, then discarding all cards except the Zeers and moving on to evening. So now that we've seen two of these factions, let's show an example round. Here we've got the Mechanical Marquise, the Electric Eerie, and a human player as the Woodland Alliance. We're a few rounds in and the Alliance player has just finished their turn, so it's time for the cats. We start by drawing an order card and we get a mouse. So first we battle in each mouse clearing. There's only one that needs some violence, so we attack there and deal a damage. Huzzah! Next, we'll recruit four warriors split amongst our mouse clearings. Since this isn't an even split, we'll place one in nine, one in seven, and two in clearing two because it has the highest priority. After that, we build, and since we drew a mouse, that means we'll place a recruiter. This goes in the clearing with the most cats, but those are both full. There are two eligible clearings with two warriors, so the tiebreaker is highest priority. Next, we'll move out of each ordered clearing, but since you can't leave clearings you don't rule, these cats are stuck. Also, you need to leave three warriors behind, so in priority order, we'll take a few warriors out of our home turf and move them to the adjacent clearing with the most enemy pieces, which happens to be this space with the sympathy. Normally, moving into a sympathetic clearing means you have to give a card to the mouse player, but since bots don't have cards, the mouse player draws one from the deck. Next, we move a couple cats out of this lower clearing, and there are more enemy pieces to the left, so that's where they'll go. Since we were able to place a building, we don't take the expand step and instead move to evening. We score the rightmost space on the mouse track for three points, discard our order card, and now it's time for the birds to go. The Eerie is doing okay, but they had a turmoil recently, so there aren't a lot of cards in their decree. Still, we draw an order card, and since it has an item to craft, we'll pick it up from the supply and place it on our board, scoring just one point as all bots do. Next, we add it to the decree and start taking actions. We recruit first, so one in our only fox clearing, then three in our mouse clearing, we don't have any rabbit cards, so nothing there, and since birds are wild, we'll look for our clearing with the most enemy pieces, or if that's tied, which it is here, fewest eerie warriors. So we'll put down some birds at number eight. Next we move, going to places with no roosts and leaving only enough warriors to keep control, or to match the number of cards in the current column, whichever is higher. On our fox space, we'll move a bunch of warriors over here, and then we have three mouse cards, but that doesn't mean we move three times. We find the matching clearing where we have the most warriors, so that's nine, and we have to leave three warriors, but the other three make it out. Because there are two adjacent spaces without roosts, the first tiebreaker is fewest enemy pieces, and then lowest priority, which is a little different from the usual, but the birds aren't looking for a fight just yet. After that, we move on to the bird column, pulling a bunch of friends out of the nest, and then the birds make war. Fighting first in the fox clearing, then a mouse, going for the clearing without a roost. We target the cats because they have the most pieces, and because there are more mouse cards than any other in our decree, we deal an extra hit in this combat, and score points for removing buildings and tokens as usual. For the bird column, we target clearing 7 again, and since there are an equal number of enemy pieces, we target the cats again because they have more points. Once battle is done, we build a roost in our highest priority clearing without one, which in this case is space 7, and lastly we score 3 points for having 4 roosts on the board. Okay, so that's given you a good idea of an average turn for the birds and the cats. Let's check out the other two next, starting with the automated alliance. And these are definitely distinct from your average mouse. First off, their warriors are completely defensive, and when attacked, they'll deal an extra hit, but they don't take the higher roll like normal mice, unless you use that trade card. They'll still be spreading sympathy for points, but a lot of rules regarding that have some minor changes. For one thing, they don't have supporters. Makes sense, they don't have cards. Turns out, you don't need them, because they'll revolt every single turn if possible, which means they can get their bases on the board pretty quickly if you let them. Of course, if you remove one of their bases, you'll also remove all sympathy and matching clearings. That won't slow them down too much though, because they can spread a lot of sympathy in a round. But if they place in a clearing with three or more enemy warriors, they'll get one fewer point. Of course, if they ever need to spread sympathy and can't, they'll score five points. And if a human triggers outrage and can't discard a matching card, the mice get a point. Bots only pretend to have emotions though, so when another bot triggers outrage, they just ignore it. Lastly, we have my favorite named faction, the Vagabot. And yeah, they're pretty different too, but actually a fair bit easier to add in than the regular Vagabond if you ask me. You'll have a special Vagabot character card, there will still be quests and ruins, and you'll take actions by exhausting items, but the biggest change is that all items are considered identical. On top of that, this bot is a dedicated bachelor, so there are no relationships to keep track of. Instead, you'll just draw an order card and use this chart to tell you which actions they take and in what order. The actions are pretty clear, so just a couple important notes. First, their combat ability improves when you gain enough items. The 6th, 9th, and 12th undamaged items they get go to the battle track, each one making them stronger. 
These can't be exhausted, but they can be damaged, which removes them from the track. So it's something you'll have to keep an eye out for. And the other big thing is that they ignore the rewards on completed quest cards and just get one point. So now let's see them in action. Here we've got the automated alliance, the Vagabot with the thief identity, and a human player as the cats. As before, this is a few turns in, so let's start with the Alliance, who has managed to spread some sympathy and keep control of a base for long enough to recruit some warriors. We draw an order card as always, and we get this rabbit card with an item. We craft it and score a point, then move on to revolt. We have a sympathetic rabbit clearing, so we revolt there and remove all enemy pieces, scoring points as normal, and place our bunny base. Now because we revolted, we don't get any public pity and move on to spreading sympathy. Here we need to put down one token in an ordered, unsympathetic adjacent clearing, and since we have two available, we'll pick the one with fewer enemy warriors and score a point. We don't do the surprise revolt because we didn't draw a bird, and next we organize. Since we have a clearing with a base and three warriors, we remove those warriors and spread sympathy again, this time at the other rabbit clearing. But because there are three enemy warriors there, we score one fewer point. Lastly, we recruit at each base, discard our order card, and end our turn. The Vagabot has picked up a few items, enough to boost their strength a bit. We draw a mouse for the order card, which means we'll be questing, aiding, battling, and then repairing in that order. We happen to be in a clearing matching the current quest, so we exhaust two items and score a point. And remember, all items are the same now. Next we aid, targeting the player in our clearing with the fewest points and any items. Now the cats would be our target, but let's say they don't have a stash like the mice do. So we'll exhaust one item for each one we take and score that many points. The aided player would draw that many cards as payment, but since the mice are bots, those cards are discarded and they'll get two points instead. Anyway, since we have nine undamaged items, we place one of our exhausted items in the battle track. Next we battle, and this time we'll be targeting the cats because there are more enemy pieces. Since we have six undamaged items, we can deal two hits. The first attack is a bust, but we attack as many times as possible, exhausting two items for each attack after the first. The second battle defeats both cats, which scores us a point each, but Vagabot took one hit in return. You always damage exhausted items before unexhausted ones, but regardless, that means one of our battle items is going to break. That's okay though, because the last action is repair, so we'll exhaust one more item and fix it right up, moving it back to the battle track. And once all the actions are done, since we have nothing in the damage box, we refresh six items. We don't have anything else to repair, so we skip the next step, discard the order card, and end our turn. And hopefully those examples have given you a pretty good idea of how the clockwork factions play. I know they didn't cover every possible outcome, but once you get started with these bots, they're pretty easy to keep moving. Anyway, I've got another root video teaching the Underworld expansion, which we released very soon, so keep an eye out for that, and thank you all so much for watching. Bye!